Okay, I am Josh Summers and this is Meeting Life TV. Today I am with David Lasondak. David, thanks so much for coming on Meeting of Life today. Josh, thanks for inviting me. I'm really, really happy to be here, virtually. I'm looking forward to it too. So David, you, as an introduction, you are an allied health member in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where you maintain a clinical practice in structural integration, visceral manipulation, and other fascial modalities, which begs the question, what is a fascial modality? And for, for our benefit, you have written a, a nice book that's recently come out called Fascia, What It Is and Why It Matters. And that's going to be our topic today. And I just want to say from the outset that I really appreciate your title because it sets my job up to be much easier. <laughs> just let's start with the first thing now. Um, so fascia, it's what is it? Okay. Fascia is your connective tissue and your connective tissue system. So uh, fascia is made predominantly of collagen, which is uh, the strongest and most uh, abundant protein in the body, and it's the white stuff. Uh, so for uh, those of you who are still carnivores, um, it's, uh, it, it, it's what we think of as gristle or the white stuff in spiral cut ham, but in living organisms, animals, ourselves, it's a very lively medium, and it covers every bone, every muscle, and even every nerve and every organ. So something like this and it moves and stretches as we move and stretch. It also gives us some stability because fascia has a, uh, has a weave, kind of like nylon hosiery, that gives it both really good strength and a fair amount of stretch. Uh, problems arise when the fascia gets damaged, when it gets hardened, when it gets dried out. And uh, these things show up all the time in my clinical practice uh, as people who have had this test, this MRI, this thing, that thing, and the other thing, they're still in pain, and nobody can figure out why. And uh, that's when they come to me, and 90% of the time, we figure out why. So I want to look at, I want to talk about what you do exactly in a little bit, and I also want to talk about some of the pathologies of the fascia that you just mentioned but to, just for people that are just coming into this sort of tabula rasa, not having uh, heard the to topic before or heard the term, um, I think one of the hardest things to grok for me, at least with fascia, was the ubiquity of it. That mm -hmm. you, in your description, which I know is accurate, you're describing kind of the co like the, the the plastic coating or, or wrapping around muscles and bones and things. But it, it, it doesn't it it it, it uh, moves beyond that as well, right? It, uh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. But it is precisely that ubiquity that made it so hard to be studied for so many hundred years of anatomy. It was the stuff that was in the way of what they wanted to look at, or the preservatives and the fixatives kind of destroyed it. Uh, well, destroyed is kind of a harsh word, but kind of made it look as interesting as wet insulation. So we could just cut that away and, and throw it out because that's all it, it could be is insulation. But uh, beyond wrapping all of the major components of the body, keeping them both separate and interconnected, it goes all the way down to the cellular level in every cell of your body. So when I say system, I mean system. Okay, and when you say it goes down to the cellular level, unpack mm -hmm. that idea for me a little bit. Okay, okay. So um, every cell... And uh, we tend to think of cells as these round balls. They're so often taught that way in textbooks, but they're really not. Cells have all kinds of irregular and interesting shapes to them. Um, the cell has a cytoskeleton, okay, which is exactly what it sounds like, a cellular skeleton that helps give shape and form to the cell. Those cytoskeletons are made up of monofilaments and microfilaments of collagen that uh, – that can respond and react in mechanical ways, just like our skeleton can respond and react in mechanical ways. And those cells are actually plugged in through a particular cell receptor that pokes out of the top of the cell that responds to tensional and vibrational messages within the whole fascial system of the body. So did I unpack that or did I make it more complicated or did I do both, which is my favorite thing? I think you may have done both. <laughs> Good. But 
Right. So there's basically, I mean, I remember thinking back to my, you know, whether it was high school or pre-high school biology class, we learned that um, cells, the cell behavior was influenced by chemical messengers that would attach to chemical receptors on the cell membrane. Caffeine. Right. Yes, right. Caffeine, caffeine yeah. among other things. Mm -hmm. But what you're describing is a relatively, I mean, I, I, I'd be curious in the history of when this was discovered, but there's a relatively recent discovery that in addition to chemical receptors on the cellular membrane, there's also what are called mechanic mechano receptors, right? Mechanical receptors. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And those are the those are the, those are the receptors that are integrating or connecting what's going on within the cell to what's going on outside of the cell in terms of stresses placed on the body or mechanical forces placed on the body. Very good, Josh. I think you've read my book. Uh, well, you. <laughs> <laughs> I did no, for the for the folks at home. Um, the and you probably knew about mechanoreceptors before you read my book because I know your background. Um, but there were relatively recent discovery, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but the the mechanoreceptors and they're easy to remember because they're called integrins, like integrated or integrated shun. Um, the integrins uh, don't take chemical messages in. They don't go ooh caffeine or mm, morphine. Uh, they go ooh uh, vibration ooh pressure. And when those integrins are stimulated, uh, they send a message through the cell membrane that goes all the way down to the nucleus and can actually change which genes are firing and which genes <clears throat> are not firing. Uh, they can actually create cellular change by changing the tension within the cell. Uh, this is the groundbreaking work uh, of Donald Ingber from Harvard, which goes back to the 1990s. It's that old, but ideas in science take a long time to really filter into the mainstream. But what, what Dr. Ingber found was that if you change the shape of the cell, you can change the function of the cell. And you change it through these integrants, through messages to these integrants. That changing is occurring on the micro level or the cellular level. But Correct. what are the forces, what kinds of forces are on the macro, more macro level that are involved in uh, initiating that, that micro change? Mm -hmm. uh, compression, so push, uh, and also vibration. So, you know, a strong, I mean, if, if you think about uh, those really heavy percussive massagers mm -hmm. that people use, or even this old technique uh, that they use in Swedish massage called... Uh, to potent, um, you know, that sends a vibrational message. Um, there's also, uh, there, there, there's uh, some researcher, and I've only found his stuff on the internet that claims that there are cell receptors, uh, Pacini receptors, this gets into the nervous system, deep in the pancreas that respond to heavy bass tones at uh, concerts. <laughs> so um, I think the, I think this idea of us being affected by vibration uh, is is deeper than just a, a mechanical pressure. I think it's also a sonic one as well. So you are influencing when you go to that rock concert. You are influencing yourself on a cellular level. Yes, you are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you alluded earlier to some of the ways that um, the fascial system, the connective tissue system, can become problematic. Whether it's uh, it gets thickened or hardened or dehydrated. What are the sort of the, the the conditions that lead to those kinds of pathologies, and how do those pathologies uh, become symptomatic or, or manifest in people's experience? Okay, uh, the short answer is usually through accidents and injuries, uh, and that's the majority of cases that I see. Uh, I, I'm fortunate working where I am. I, I get some way left field kinds of things that may have autoimmune or, or other aspects involved. Um, and, and sometimes, honestly, PTSD can have physical holding patterns associated with it well. So if we go to the macro level, um, your, your fascia is, uh, is, is, um, the head of sports medicine at Ulm University once said, fascia tells your muscles what to do. So in terms of holding tension, they have a strong component to that holding of tension. So um, if you have an accident or you have an injury or you have a surgery, uh, that incision 
disrupts this fascial membrane. It puts a rip in it that can never quite be rewoven before it was ripped or before it was damaged. So in the case of a high impact injury where there's swelling, these little collagen connections break open and that allows the fluid to come up out of the extracellular matrix and create the swelling. Eventually that will calm down and heal and I would never recommend getting fascial work while you're actively swollen. That's a bad idea. Um, but these are the sorts of things. Now when they heal, they need to be healed properly and they heal properly by getting good mechanical messages. So it used to be umpty ump years ago that when you had uh, an injury that was serious enough, they would put you in a cast till the bone healed and they would tell you not to move or they would immobilize your arm and say, do not move this for two, three, four weeks. We now know that's wrong. And I think it's in, it's in the first chapter of the book, mm -hmm. John. Uh, there's a high definition, um, micro photography of what the fascial network looks like in a healthy area and then what it looks like when that same area is immobilized for a period of three weeks and it looks like a garden where the weeds have gone berserk because that regular physical stimulation tells the collagen fibers which you know how the body should build and maintain itself in the absence of regular physical um, activity it will grow every which way because it's not getting any particular stimulation. So to, to make this a little simpler, it's it's really good that the body does this. So let's say I'm a, I'm a baseball pitcher and I'm putting a lot of force through my body as a right-handed pitcher in a particular way. That collagen network over a period of months and a few years is going to slowly change itself to provide the necessary stability and resilience to support what I'm doing on a regular basis. Uh, and that's great. That That's part of how we literally on the inside grow and change. Now, where it's not maybe so great is to use the, the current digital. Everybody's down on the digital culture, right? So, uh, you know, if I'm looking at my phone all day long like this and I'm going to work and my workstation is up here and I'm typing like this and then I go home and I play video games like that, I'm putting all this tension into my upper body. I'm having to elevate my shoulders and lower my neck a little bit, and I'm using my hands in a very limited fashion, kind of like a T-Rex. Um, there's a cartoon for you. And, um, so if that's all I do, over a period of six to 18 months, that collagen is, gonna or is going to reorganize itself to support this. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to look exactly like this after 18 months, but there's going to be hardening throughout this aspect. Uh, the upper aspect of my body, and even points beyond possibly. Mm -hmm. If don't do yoga or exercise or go play basketball or do something to vary the constant message that I'm given to my body by my repetitive usage. So what will happen is the collagen will densify in those areas, possibly even dry out in places because there's a there's a lubricating fluid between the muscles that's secreted in the fascial layers. And if that doesn't get sufficiently stimulated, then it just kind of like glue will dry out until you can stimulate it and get it producing hyaluronic acid again. So these are more the kinds of things that I see. Can I yeah. pause, you, pause you for one second? Yeah, sorry, because I'm, just, I'm, let, me just, let me just replay that a little bit because okay. you're speaking – the way you're speaking about it reminds me of uh, an image or a metaphor that came to me during my morning meditation today when I was thinking okay. about talking to you. Um, the idea came – I had the memory of a, as a kid making um, pinatas with paper mache where okay. we'd blow up a balloon and then take strips of newspaper, dipping them in plaster of Paris – that would be laid upon the balloon mm -hmm. in successive strips and layers, and then the thing would dry and harden. And I was wondering if you saw any analogy in that, so that the, the balloon could be removed, removed, but that hardening of the of the of the paper mache or the of the newspaper with plaster of Paris would thicken and harden and become quite brittle. And mm -hmm. it, it struck me as something similar, like if there's a chronic holding pattern of the muscle, with in an intentional way. Um, and kind of immobilized for a period of time. You're saying that the body, the, the fascial system of the body adapts to that chronic holding and kind of becomes thicker and harder. And it becomes the dominant pattern. Yes, that's an excellent analogy. So if you think of those strips of paper mache with the plaster of Paris and the balloon underneath it, 
is a fixed system. It's going to harden. It's going to dry and it's going to harden around that shape of the balloon. If the balloon is expanding and contracting with air, then those strips of collagen and hyaluronic acid are going to be getting enough stimulation that they'll still have some stability, but they'll also have some mobility. Mm -hmm. So that's an excellent analogy. Well, thanks. It, you know, it, I would like to claim it, but as most ideas come to me, I realize I'm not generating them in meditation. They just come to me and <laughs> coming from somewhere else. So I in your subconscious mind deep within my subconscious. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So the question then is, if if it sounds like immobilization is is one of the the, the etiological factors here, mm -hmm. what is what's part of the prescription? Is it just movement, or is move like moving going to be enough? Well, this is yeah. Um, I don't think so. In, in my professional opinion, um, no. Um, I think, or or put it this way, um, it's it's a slower path. Um, so, and in your, uh, you're a yoga teacher. Yes. Uh, I, I've been doing yoga since my early twenties. Um, and certainly I've had some <clears throat> very profound experiences of experiencing my own body in that circumstance. But if, um, you know, if, if, if I, if I can only move my arm within a certain range, it may be possible that over a period of months and years of doing yoga, I will increase that because of the slow mindful quality of yoga. If I'm not doing crazy Ashtanga flippy do yoga, um, you know, because I'm really focusing on, Oh, I want that extension. I want that extension. I want that extension. So that stimulation over time can work. Um, I think it's a lot better if, if somebody comes into me and says, wow, you know, when I'm doing this, I, I, my shoulder doesn't move very much. If I can go in and manually, have them stretch while I'm doing compression and shear and the things I do with my hands. Then they go to the yoga class. Suddenly they can do more with it than they could have before the intervention in faster. And it will take them places that I just can't go with my hands either. So I think, I, I think it's a prescription and I always, I always give uh, my patients homework. So I, I don't give them a tear off sheet of 12 things they don't have time to do. I usually try to find one or two simple things that they can do to, to, as they, since they have more motion now, to help them maintain that motion between their, their treatments with me. So you're speaking a little bit about what you do professionally, and it might be good to pause and just un unpack that a little bit, because people yeah. listening might think, oh, he sounds like a massage therapist, or he sounds like you know a body worker of some sort. But yeah. specifically, in your field as a clinician, A, what, what do you, how do you name what you do, and then, and then what specifically are you working on um, in, in your, in your specific work. Okay. So, uh, I don't mind being called a body worker, not at all. Um, because that's, a, that's, uh, and if you looked at what I was doing from the outside, you might think it looked like massage. Um, but it doesn't feel that way. And, and the goals are different. So, uh, as concisely as possible, uh, somebody comes to see me because they have a complaint, whether it's chronic pain or shin splints, or I can't do X, Y, or Z as well as I used to. Um, and uh, I, I listen to their story, I get their medical history, and then they get down into a pair of shorts, and, uh, and I look at them. And I look at their standing posture, and I look at it from all the angles. And because I understand the way the bones line up and what's going on underneath the bones, and also taking into consideration the things that they like to do, um, I can make some pretty well-educated guesses of where they're stuck. Okay, sometimes it's very, very, very obvious. Uh, like in the case of a driver who drove a stick shift who always had a problem on one side of his low back and his lip, rib cage was literally shifted to the side where the stick shift was. So if his hips were here, his rib cage was over there. Mm. So that was real obvious to see, okay, here's why you're always having problem in that part of your back. Um, sometimes it's sneakier or less obvious. Um, sometimes people come in and they, they, they look like they were drawn by Pablo Picasso. Uh, and that can be a little complex to begin to untangle, but you do it slowly and systematically. So what I will then do is, is map out an, uh, an area that we're going to focus on for that treatment. And I'm going to use my hands in a very slow, methodical way while they very slowly stretch in a particular direction. 
So let's just say, for whatever reason, I was working on the quadriceps, the thigh muscles, the outer thigh muscles. I might be going up the thigh muscles this way, while they're just very bending their bending their, bending their knee and extending their knee like this to put stretch in through the quadriceps like that. So that that stretch combined with my compression and glide and angle. Um, seems to be interacting with the fascial network uh, more than the muscle and it feels nothing like massage and because they're active in the treatment it also stimulates the nervous system and it also gets the brain working in ways that a passive treatment just doesn't quite so much and i think that gets a better faster result and uh to just chime in with a personal uh Testimonial. This, I've, I've received this kind of body work myself and distinguish from massage. Massage, uh, massage can be deep. Sometimes people talk about they like deep tissue massage. That's, I mean, maybe you can comment on that in a second. But um, this kind of body work, it, 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 it has a kind of, at times, it can feel like a, a, almost like a blowtorch is coming in <laughs> and, and right. just lighting up the area. I mean, it is, yeah. it's, it's a hot kind of sensation um, while, yes. while things are being stimulated. So um, it, it translated as itch also, which I find interesting. Mm -hmm. Or like a dull bruise that doesn't feel good, but they're like, oh, wow, that place really needs to be touched, mm -hmm. even though it feels like a dull bruise. <laughs> But, but come back to the issue of, like, we use the phrase densification, which I think, which I learned in an, another webinar with you, is the, is that the more contemporary term for adhesion? So uh, if, yes. If people think of muscular knots, that's usually some kind of fascial adhesion, right? It's not. Well, or, or densification. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, it's just, you know, it's all, it's, it's all metaphorical in a way. Um, but the preferred clinical word we like now is densification because there is a buildup of collagen in that area. So if I'm, you know, I feel that, I'm, you know, I feel that is like going over and it's smooth, smooth, smooth. And then suddenly I hit a speed bump mm -hmm. or suddenly things aren't sliding as well next to each other as they should be. That's, that's another reason for the slow active movement is I can feel how the muscles are sliding relative to each other or relative to the bone and that in for in that <clears throat> that also can have an effect uh, on how specific or general i use my hands is, is feeling that quality of glide okay. and obviously you're uh, an external force being applied to that area um, mm -hmm. as, a, as the practitioner is it something that uh, someone could do on their own is, is, oh, I mean, this is this is a good question. Self myofascial release. Um, obviously, I have a bias because I want to keep working. <laughs> um, but I uh, I do have uh, <clears throat> I do have a roller that I'm quite fond of. And no, this is not an, a paid endorsement. Um, I like this one because of the ridges. It allows me to get into places that I couldn't get into otherwise. Um, so I think to a degree you can stimulate the fascial network, but there are some places that are just really, really difficult um, to get to. Mm -hmm. um, and also you need to be slow and discriminating. I, I, um, quick example, uh, I had somebody come to me with a, a trendy thing, which is IT band syndrome. And um, Which I, IT band is? Okay, so your IT band is that strip of white that goes down the upper that's here on the leg, um, that goes from the crest of the hip down to the outer aspect of the knee. It's designed to help keep us on two legs. It's very, very thick, and it's very, very regular in its pattern. It's not designed to stretch very much. It's designed to support us. Um, and um, a lot of times people wind up having pain in this area, and they try to stretch it out with the foam roller. That's never going to happen. Um, it would take about 220 pounds of force to create a 1% deformation. Now, this person who came to see me had been rolling uh, an hour a day for a month with his foam roller trying to work out his IT band. All he did was continually inflame it. Hmm. So, you know, I'm not saying don't use these tools, but, but you need to, you need to use them with some knowledge of, of what you're doing, why you're doing it and how much is enough. 
you know, he could have played with the edges where the front of the IT band is close to the quadriceps or to the rear where it's close to the hamstring muscles. And that, that could get you, that could get you some good stuff. But if you're just pounding away on it, um, that's of limited value. Good to know. Um, with the term densification that came up, uh, it, 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 made me think of something I've heard coming out of some of the, uh, maybe a recent fascial Congress, mm -hmm. which um, maybe would be a good time to introduce this, this uh, entity too, that, that there's a, uh, every third year now, there's a international Congress yep. on research coming out around fascia and its impact on our health. And you've been, I think a presenter as well as a, a recorder of many of the, the proceedings at these Congresses, haven't you? Uh, yes, I have. Uh Predominantly at the University of Ulm in Germany, where every two years we do a uh, what Robert Schleip calls a Fascia Summer School, uh, which is like a week-long intensive where we invite all the rock stars in the fascia world, but we limit it to maybe six or seven dozen people, and we all hang out for the better part of six days. So it's it's a you get a lot more one-on-one -on -one time with these people, whereas the big research conferences are like you know seven, eight, nine hundred people. Um, so I've done, I've done both of those. Uh, the next one is in Germany. It's in Berlin this November. Uh, and you can find out more information at fasciaresearch.org. Great. Well, one of the things that, you know, you were talking about the densification causing kind of, uh, dysfunction or pain in the body. But one of the things that I've heard come out of a recent Congress is that there seems to be some link. And I was wondering if you could comment on this, but there seems to be some link between densification and uh, tumor migration, cancer tumor migration. Mm -hmm. Is that in fact true? Uh, well, or is that a can of worms that we don't want to get into? Oh, that's a, that's a cancer of worms. Um, you know, that's a really interesting area. And um, you, there was a, there was a wonderful uh, conference on, uh, specifically on fascia and cancer that was much more acupuncture focused. And, and acupuncture seems to, by the way, have an interaction with the fascial network. Um, but uh, if you, I bring this up because if you, if you Google fascia, cancer, Harvard, there, there's complete videos of the proceedings that are worth watching. Um, the tumors like to create a microenvironment within the cellular matrix that is very dried out. Um, and that seems to increase the proliferation of cancer cells. Uh, so the idea is that if you're if you're uh, more lubricated, I suppose, that it's harder for these cells to take root and grow. Uh, there remains some controversy over whether manual methods can can actually proliferate the migration of cancer cells or actually help slow down the migration of cancer cells by bringing more hydration to the areas, uh, to those areas that are densified and or dried out. Um, I've seen studies that indicate both. It's mm -hmm. in, in uh, Tom Finley, who is an MD, who's also a, a structural integrator, and, and Helen Langevin, who's a, another PhD and a researcher who is an acupuncturist, um, that they have some very strong and, and uh, well-supported differences of opinion. Uh, so the, the jury is still kind of out. Just gonna, I was just going to say that. It sounds like the jury's still out. But the reason I wanted to bring it up was because sometimes people think, you know, fascia or the connective tissue is only related to biomechanical functioning. Like how can you move or how can you not move or if you're in pain, physical pain or not. Or not. But it really has kind of more um, global impact in, in terms of your overall health. And one of the the... The connections on that is, I think, also the sense of self. Our sense of self is mediated to some degree through the fashion. That's something I want. I know you get into in the book, but I mm -hmm. wanted to uh, explore that with you now. It's like, how does this this webbing in the body, this sort of this collagenous webbing of the body, um, mediate our sense of self? Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> that's, um, that's, I know it's chapter like six or yeah, eight, six, I, I seven, was, eight, maybe. Expect, I wasn't expecting to go here this morning, uh, but that's fine. That's fine. Uh, I, I want to go, well, how do you think it impacts our sense of self, Josh? Uh, but you're interviewing me, not the other way around. Um, okay, so there seems to be an observable... Um, 
link between how we carry ourselves, our posture, and our and our behavior. Um, the 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 simplest one is uh, to look at people who suffer from depression. Uh, they have a few ways that they tend to physically present. And again, I'm going to keep it to the upper body because we're sitting down. People can watch us. Um, but uh, the shoulders often are elevated and also medially brought in. The chest is sunken and down. They have this kind of, we call it an affect. Um, so what's, what's this person's general affect? You know, are they, you know, are they bright and sunny? Are they really out there and, and, and uh, authoritative? Are they kind of drawn in and quiet? Um, and again, if we get into regular stimulation of the connective tissue, if I'm really sad and depressed, and I'm really sad and depressed all the time, after a while, I'm just going to look like this. This is going to be me. And um, there's, a, there's a theory of psychology and the brain called um, that. <laughs> help, help me, Josh. Have, have not in not the embodied um, embodied theory of I'm just I'm buying you time right now. It's two words. It's two words. It's two words. Embodied cognition. Embodied cognition. It's going to run back and get the book uh, called embodied cognition, which is the idea that the the brain and the body that the body is inextricably linked to how the brain processes reality. Okay, mm -hmm. that that consciousness and processing. Uh, is not some external or trans body, new word I'm making up, trans body, <clears throat> excuse me, experience, okay? Um, so if, if, if I'm like this long enough, this becomes me. And those people who come in to see me who maybe have, um, let's call it, to make it easy, a sunken chest, folded in shoulders, their head sticks out. Um, when they go to breathe, it's like, <sighs> They sigh a lot. Um, they don't have a lot of lung capacity. They have a depressed affect. Likewise, if you suffer from depression, your body may just naturally start to do this. I'm feeling down. This is an example of, of embodied cognition, which cataloged over 7,500 metaphors uh, that utilize the body to explain mental and emotional states. Uh, to show that we reason largely through metaphor, um, not pure logic. And um, so if you begin, so if we accept the fact that over a period of months and years, that this, this being like this and being sad starts to get woven so that my body begins to hold this posture, going in and changing that uh, can have some profound experiences on emotional capacity, on mood, I mean, one of the most interesting things that I see clinically is when somebody's family member um, says to me, you know, because, I mean, it happens, people bring, you know, people don't always come to their appointments by themselves. Uh, and afterwards, uh, I might have a, a quiet moment with a spouse or a brother or somebody, and they're like, wow, you know, this person is, is um, they're so much nicer to be around since they started working with you. Or you do, you just get feedback about how they feel better, but their behavior is actually improved in some way. So it would be disingenuous to say, I'm going to cure your depression with my hands. Um, but you do see these kinds of effects happen. I, I would like to see this effect studied more. Uh, but it's, I don't see anybody doing clinical trials on structural integration and depression, but it would be fascinating. And so in theory, then, it sounds like um, the affective mind state of sadness could lead to a postural pattern which then reinforces that that mind state of sadness or depression but could it go the other way around yes where, whereby the just i mean i'm just thinking of all the the articles you see now that 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 links uh sitting as as sort of the the, the new carcinogen and that everyone mm -hmm. needs to avoid sitting but the idea that came to me while you're lis listening <laughs> or listening to you is that if you're sitting for a long period of time, you're going to tend to be in a slump position if you're not vigilant around that. And that in itself, are you saying that it potentially or theoretically could, could get the brain to fire certain neurotransmitters or certain uh, lack of neurotransmitters that would, be, that would potentiate a pattern of depression 
or sadness? Um, well, it certainly has the capability of working both ways. Just as we can affect the the body via the mind, I believe we can affect the mind via the body. Um, in terms of sitting, it's again, it goes back to the M word. It goes back to mindfulness. Um, you know, how are you sitting? How are you using your body when you sit? Does anybody really taught you to sit? for eight hours. My, my father worked in steel mills. That had its own repetitive use problems, not to mention much more catastrophic injury potential. Um, so we, we've gone from manufacturing mills to digital mills, and, and everything that we do has a, has a potential for repetitive motion, therefore strain hardening, and, uh, and a change in posture that we don't want. Um, I'm trying to think if uh, if I've seen people who come in who are desk jockeys um, who suffer from depression or it's an affect uh, or, or they have a depressed affect, um, it's been a while and, and nobody's really popping into mind. But certainly it could if that's all you do. I mean, just after two or three years of constantly being forward and pulled in and doing this, it's going to change your lungs ability to expand in your chest. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that, that, that inability to intake oxygen in a richer way is definitely, I don't know, I would go so far as to say, well, it's going to make you depressed, but it's certainly going to depress your responses to things because you're just not going to be functioning as fully as you can. Another can of worms. Yeah. This is the can of worms interview. Can of worms interview. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. There's a lot of things we can speculate about based right. on what we do know, but, uh, but we want to just be clear that there's speculations. And I think that's an important point to make because, well, for one, the the, the scientific interest in fascia itself is a how 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 old is the research in, in fascia at this point? It's fairly new, isn't it? Um, yes, uh, I mean there's some old research in fascia out there, but it's a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. But it's been growing exponentially over the last ten or fifteen years. So I think when I googled. Uh, fascia in the uh in pubmed which is like the database for all the peer-reviewed published papers there were like 347 mentions of fascia in the year 2000 in uh last year uh there were almost uh, i'm sorry uh, 347 period uh in 2000 last year there was like 847 so there's been a huge change in the last 17 years and that's that's still I mean that's a big number in and of itself. It's still not a huge number if you like type in other things. But for us it's a big deal. Yeah. But it is still in its relative infancy and so yes, a lot of stuff that you're is, gonna be reporting is. on is still early days. Um but suggestive of, of some Oh well, very very suggestive and, and very credible in that the people who are doing the research in fascia are some very very highly skilled, uh, thoughtful, well-educated people who are uh, designing research to find out things, not designing research to get a particular result or prove uh, a particular theory. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, it's almost pure research in that sense. So much of research tends to be results-driven. You know, well, if we test this drug, what are the outcomes of this drug so we can sell it? As opposed to, well, let's study this and find out what's really going on here. So I sort of... Um, I kind of look at fascia research as inner astronomy. Mm -hmm. It's another new term I just made up, inner astronomy. Inner astronomy, another great word for the fascial net that you have in your book is the intranet. But, Thank you. And, and in the fascial world at large, fascia is considered to be the extracellular matrix, which certainly sounds astronomical to me. Well, it does. In thinking about it, 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 can, it can seem very much that way. Um, I, how infinitely small can you go? <laughs> uh, how infinitely out there can you go? Um, but yeah, the, the fascia also tends to function as a body wide communication system. And, and this is based on, again, things that we observe. There's the obvious tensional messages. So if everybody sitting there watching this right now, provided you're not driving, stretches your arm out and just keep stretching, try to stretch even beyond further than you can go without hurting yourself, you're going to feel a message of stretch down into your shoulder, maybe all the way down into your low back or your buttocks or even your leg, depending on how you're sitting. If you 
If you push your feet into the floor and do it again, you're going to feel that tensional message even further throughout the body. But there's a, a class of cell that we discovered called a telocyte that uh, is a molecular messenger cell that lives in the fascial network. And what it's doing there, we don't even know yet. We just know that it's like a little shuttle that uh, carries one chemical uh, from one place in the net to another place in the net and then delivers that payload. Uh, but we just discovered that cell less a little over a year ago. And uh, so how about that? There's a new cell in the body. Ooh. New cell, a telocyte. A telocyte. So yeah. at the cocktail hour, I can bring that up. Um, Please do. Mm -hmm. uh, but how about telocytes today? Telocytes. What? But you don't, and you don't know exactly what the function of this is. The cell is yet. Um, it definitely has something to do with regulation of autoimmune function, going back to cancer, going back to other things, and that's something that we sometimes see when we're doing fascial therapies. Is the people that have autoimmune disorders sometimes need a tweak in their medication, even though I'm working to better their biomechanical uh, relationships and, and ease their strain and their pain that sometimes by the by, oh, my thyroid medication just got cut in half. Oh, interesting. And you see that enough and you're like, okay, why is that going on? Well, it might be the telocyte. Hmm. In the book, you also reference a study, I think that was conducted at uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center on mindfulness and uh, yes, its effects on or and the perception of pain. Mm -hmm. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes, you are. Yes, right. you are. And there was uh, an interesting mechanism in that study that was not. I wasn't aware of that before. And that usually, when I think of mindfulness improving perception of pain, it tends to involve a kind of cognitive re reappraisal of the sensation. So you're aware of the sensation. The ouchness of the sensation is still pretty significant. But the resistance to it, the, the, the sort of the inner calamity around that ouchness uh, mm -hmm. dampens down. And so it might still be there, but it's not much, it's not much of a problem. It's sort of what in Buddhism we call the second arrow isn't, isn't uh, stinging as much. Um, but what did you find in that study? Okay. Um, and this is great because I take it most of the people who uh, tune in here are very, very familiar with meditation. So we don't need to cover what that is. Um, so this study, uh, looked at a group of people who were taught mindfulness meditation to modulate their perception of low back pain. It's just kind of like what you were saying. It's like, I may have the pain, but the pain does not have me. There's a distinct change in that state to see that if, if it went, what the wording was that it changed their perception of their back pain. They couldn't say, well, it changed the cause of your back pain because we have to be able to measure that. But, but does it change your functional experience on a daily basis of that back pain? The results were overwhelmingly positive. The problem is the sample was very small. Mm -hmm. We had uh, compliance issues with that study. Um, so only about eight people actually made it through to the end. Now that study has since been, uh, that pilot study has since been replicated with a much more robust sample of 200 people and we found the same thing uh, that's happened since the book was published, uh, so it will be in the second edition. Um, and what we found was that, that yes, mindfulness meditation can change the perception of pain, but when they were tested for mechanical issues, so yes, I don't feel my pain as much as I used to, but when I still go to reach for that thing at the top shelf, yeah, I can feel that low back pain again. So mechanically it didn't change, but the overall on a daily basis, what's my pain from one to 10 did lessen by using meditation. Now, we also know from other research, uh, or at least I do, um, that meditators seem to have uh, an abundant quantity of nitric oxide in their system. Uh, that seems to be a byproduct of, of meditating. And um, there's a study that Robert Schleip did on active fascia, I don't say active fascial cultures. Basically, it was a piece of fresh fascia excised out of a rat and put into a, a little container where it could be drizzled with chemical substances to see how the tissue would react. You know, basically, if you poke it with a stick, will it do something? That's kind of how we determine on a basic level if something's living or dead. So if we put this chemical on it, will it, will it contract? Will it get tight? Will it pull in on itself? He was looking to stimulate a contraction. But, but buried in the paper was just the little uh, note that nitric oxide caused it to relax. 
And as a clinician who wants people's tight fascia to relax, that was a lot more interesting to me than, than what might cause it to contract. But from a histological perspective, I can appreciate both of that. So I'm going, well, okay, if meditation lessens the perception of low back pain, and we know that if we meditate, we increase nitric oxide production, and nitric oxide causes fascia to relax, well, hey, that to me seems to be a direct hypothesis as to how meditation could have an impact on low back pain. So now what I want to see if I can get rolling in the next couple of years is can we do a study that has a group with low back pain that meditates, a group that low back pain that meditates, but also gets a specific mechanical intervention, and at the end of the day, is there improvement um, so using, I, using both? So I have two follow-up questions to that. One is, is you know, thinking through this, this through, is reducing the perception of pain even a good thing? So if, if someone is trying to mechan like functionally move and they're still noticing the pain, um, I can imagine an argument that would say that's that pain signal is telling telling the person that there's something wrong in the body and that they should they should attend to that and they maybe shouldn't do that movement pattern until things are, are rectified, and and it, it might be interpreted that decreasing the perception of that of that experience is is a kind of analgesic that is just going to set the body part up or the body up for repeated injury because you're not sensing the signal that, that, that would prevent you from doing that very thing. So that's question one, which you can take. Okay. Yeah. Hold on to question two, because that, that's a biggie. Um, so in some cases, possibly I'm going to go out there and say, in most cases, not at all. Um, why, why do we take, um, so meditation is your inner ibuprofen. Use responsibly. Um, the, uh, some people's perception of pain, and if you could just lean forward into the camera and I could touch your scalp there. Um, you know, some people, you just put the lightest pressure on an area. I've seen this when there's been recent trauma, a surgery, and I don't mean the surgery where the skin is still kind of inflamed and in the, in the sutures are healing, but I mean like six months, eight months, nine months, even years later. And the barest touch, and these people are just having this reaction that's way off the charts in terms of pain. And I'm not even really putting any compression into that area. So sometimes there's something that the body can become so hyper uh, on guard with trying to protect an area that it almost is unhealthy. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of the chronic pain is like that dull, constant bruising kind of oh it's just always there and it, it and it's such a drag on people's ability uh and and frankly their mood that's what we're talking about with this kind of perception of pain like okay i'm aware the pain is there but i'm not going to let it get in my way of getting up and going to the grocery store today or doing something else that i really want to do however they also i, I would argue are aware that that they know where their limits are if they go too far, or at least they should. Uh, but I, not having worked exactly on that study, I'm not sure how finely granulated uh, uh, that was in that regard. But I, um, but I would, I would say, you know, as a rule, no. Uh, particularly because it's, it's again, it's a perceptual state. It's not a rehab state. Almost everybody in a rehab state, which is what I tend to work with has a time where they feel so good they overdo it. Uh, and then, you know, for a few days they're a little sore than they'd like to be. Um, but I'm not aware of anybody in the study who overdid it because their perception was tamped down. And so you're describing, you know, one way of, for me to think this through is that sometimes in, in meditation we think about our mental reaction being overblown to the actual stimulus of what's going on. And you're describing a way that the, the, the body's reaction in terms of signaling of pain is over amplified commensurate to what's actually going on in the, on the tissue level. Correct. Correct. And there's, there's the whole, um, pain science, uh, people that pain is all in the brain. Pain is an output of the brain. Um, there's a lot of validity to that point of view. I don't know that it's the whole picture. Certainly for these people, um, that is the most important part of their pain picture is how, how hugely uh, stimulating that particular area produces such an extreme response. So, so practically, 
Um, where, where I go with that is I have somebody who is really has a hard time being touched there. Um, they need to, we need to normalize that to the point where they can be touched. So sometimes I find that if they put their hand on my hand or they put their hand on it, then I put my hand on their hand. It acts as kind of some kind of strange short circuit where they can at least allow that area to have some time, some kind of tactile discrimination. Um, the other thing that we know too, is that when there is pain, proprioception goes down. So should I unpack that word? Please, yes. Okay, so proprioception is your brain's instinctive knowing where your body is. So if all of you sitting out there, again, as long as you're not driving, uh, close your eyes and touch your finger to your nose, you can probably all do that. That's because your body can feel itself. You don't have to see your body in order to move it. There's there's an instinctual, almost subconscious level of just being able to feel your body in space and what it's doing. Uh, but it's that's different than coordination. Proprioception is literally your sixth sense. And there are a number of studies I cover in my book where they found that if you deadened proprioception in an area of the body and then had people try to do activity with it, they immediately got a pain response. Um, I mentioned those sliding layers of the muscles earlier um, where um, the fascia around the muscles is responsible for uh, keeping those areas lubricated. Uh, in those sliding layers, there are a lot of these sensory nerves that sensory nerves give us hot, cold, pressure, uh, tension, all those kinds of messages. Um, in the proprioceptive states, it's as if those sensory nerves only know how to call 911, only know how to dial in an emergency, like, wait, don't do that. Because it's like literally on an instinctual level, that area of the body cannot be felt. So in absence of being able to feel it, um, it sends out a danger signal. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the really weird off the charts things with people who are missing a limb, but they can feel pain in the foot in the limb they don't have anymore. So that's where, so that's where I say, okay, that pain is now put of the brain thing with the phantom limb syndrome. Wow, that's a thing. But I think it works from the bottom up also, not just the top down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mentioning phantom limb pain uh, reminds me of, I believe it was the neuroscientist Ramachandran who devised this very ingenious therapy for phantom limb pain where he would put people into a mirror box where they would wave their, their intact limb that would generate a mirror of the missing limb. Right, 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 right. But the brain would, you know, through the through visual uh, um, input, see that the, the 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 missing limb was actually functioning normally, and the pain immediately would disappear. We're really weird, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's I mean, that's like what a what a what an interesting. If I was designing an organism, what a. Uh, what an interesting uh, feature. Is it a software bug? I don't know. Uh, but it's fascinating to me that such a simple procedure could create such a profound result. I, I also know somebody who on their on their fake leg put a, a dot on the bottom of their foot that when they got their phantom limb pain, if they pushed that dot, if they put pressure on that dot, even when the leg was detached from their body, their phantom limb pain would go away. Very, very spooky stuff. Yeah, yeah. So that's 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 the part that that's way 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 out there. That definitely, you know, that doesn't have that doesn't have a tissue component at all. But I think there are other circumstances that that absolutely do. Mm -hmm. Now, so in picking up the thread of proprioception, awareness of uh, where the body is and how the body is, um, increasing proprioception seems to be a way to dial down one's pain experience. Mm -hmm. There's some studies on that. It, is there a takeaway for people that they could apply to their ordinary life that would increase proprioception? Um, <clears throat> what we found, when I say we, I'm talking about the, the fascia research people in, in Germany that I hang out with and um, such. Um, again, I'm going to go with slow, mindful movement. Um, tactile discrimination. So this is where you know, if I have somebody who has a lot of proprioceptive issues, there are a couple of specific yoga teachers who do um, 
I don't want to call it remedial yoga. I don't want to call it beginner yoga because it's kind of like one step uh, behind that. Um, so, so that it is, um, and I'm just sorry, I'm blanking on the word. Um, but it's, it, you know, it's like they, they may, they may be sitting with their legs out like this and just reaching their arms up over their head, you know, and just doing a little bend one way and a little bend the other way. And they might spend a couple of minutes on that. So it's gentle yoga. Yeah. So it's a very gentle way of stimulating that discrimination and that sense of proprioception in a safe environment where you feel like, okay, I can see how much is too much. Uh, because what, what tends to happen is um, the less that we do something, the less we have the capacity to do something, both on a level of the tissue itself and the relationship between the tissue, the nervous system, and the brain. So if we can find mindful, gentle ways to stimulate change, we can get a result that improves where we were if we hadn't done it whatsoever. I'm, I'm rehabbing an Achilles tendon injury and you know, I've got to do it by getting out there and not just walking, but stimulating it in all kinds of directions and being careful about my footwear. Um, but I can't do it just by giving my Achilles tendon a break for three weeks. That's going to get me not the right result. Mm. So uh, I just got to be thoughtful about it and also listen to my body when that signal is like, okay, that feels really irritated. That feels like too much to me. And trust that instinctive knowing where my body says, yeah, I think I've had enough for right now. I'm not going to do that pose or I'm going to modify that pose even though the teacher told me not to. Or it's the end of a long day of therapy. I'm just going to put my leg up on the couch and put a little ice on it. But the impact of whatever you're doing, whatever intervention it is, is enhanced by paying attention to what's going on while it's, while it's occurring versus just tuning right. out, whether it's on the treadmill looking at uh, Netflix or Hulu or, or zoning out in the gym, it's, 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 a, it's a discriminative attention to the subtlety of what's, what's going on during um, the activity. It, it is. And there's, there's a study I referenced, I think, in Chapter 8 by Laura Vermosley, who's the smartest pain science guy I know out there, where they found um, they, uh, <clears throat> they did the same therapy on uh, a group of people who all had the same condition. And in the control group, they got to listen to music, read a book, read a magazine. They got to tune out in the experimental group. They had to pay attention to the area being treated and give specific feedback to the therapist about what they were feeling, where they were feeling it and so on. That group got overwhelmingly better results in terms of range of motion uh, after the treatment than the passive group. So, Again, thinking about, well, how do we take this research and do something interesting with it? Um, I think there is something to be gained. Uh, it doesn't have to be yoga. By going to the gym, by being on the treadmill, and really being in your body while you are there, not watching the Netflix, not just listening to the boom, da -da boom, da -da boom for stimulation and motivation, but really like feeling the quality of what you're doing, not just the quantity of what you're doing. I think that increases your relationship to yourself on a physical level. And, you know, the better you relation, you improve the relationship to your body, that's, that stays with you for life. That, that's a good, um, maybe potential closing point. I want to ask you, do you have time okay. to tackle the concept of tensegrity? Oh boy. Um, in three minutes uh, or less. Yeah, you know, ten seconds in three minutes or less. Okay, so and maybe I, I'll set you up while you gather your thoughts around that. Um, sure, I can do it. <laughs> we te we t we tend to think of the body in 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 isolation in terms of like I have pain in this in this particular area. This is where I need to work on something. Like I have shoulder pain, so therefore that needs that's what needs to be worked upon. Or I have tight hamstrings, and I need to you know do lots of stretches for my hamstrings to loosen up that tension, etc. But the emerging model in the fascial world is that because of the, the ubiquitous interconnectivity of this tissue, um, when you move one part, you're influencing the, the macro whole mm -hmm. uh, is one, ta one takeaway. Um, yes. And that relates to this concept of tensegrity, which is a term coined by, a neologism coined by um, Buckminster Fuller, the architect, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. The, uh, the artist who created it called it floating compression sculptures. I just happen to have one right here. Um, and it's a combination of the words tension and integrity. 
So we have to have a healthy amount of tension, otherwise we would collapse. But too much tension isn't good either. So how do you have balanced tension? How do you have balanced tension throughout the whole organism? So in the tensegrity model of the body, the, the old mechanical model is, you know, it's a lever and a pulley. And, you know, the bicep and the elbow joint is definitely a lever and a pulley. But then we have this model that the body is a machine and it's all levers and pulleys. And that's not really true either. Uh, in the tensegrity model, the bones float. The bones don't actually touch, which in the body they don't either. If you look at any skeleton model, it's held together by wires and screws. Um, but the bones float in a tensional network that is contiguous, meaning that all the borders touch. But the bones themselves are suspended in here. Now, when it gets pulled on, it can cause a deformation. So I see a lot of people who come in like this. Uh, and you need to be able to understand where the deformation is so that you can create a change in the tension that increases the stability in the mobility so that things function better. So, you know, and the idea here about the deformation is if I apply enough force on it long enough, then suddenly I become this deformed thing, okay, as opposed to something that's more springy and can handle uh, the tensions and compression that life throws at me. And we know that this tensegral, oops, and I just, I just dislocated a bone. How about that? Um, <laughs> but I want to point out that the, this, this arrangement is based on a three-dimensional triangle or a truss model. And that's the way our cells are constructed. Our cells have this tensegrity nature to them. And if you pull and tug on the cells, you're going to change the function of the cells. And cells that are stretched tend to function healthier than cells that aren't stretched. And those cells that aren't stretched tend to go into apoptosis, which is a death program. This says, okay, so you've lived your day, die off, and let's replace you with a new one. Um, so this tensegrity idea, it's not just for fascia and bones. It's for your cells, too. And that's, again, in Donald Eber's papers. Mm -hmm. And in my book in Chapter 2. So it, it, it makes me think of another book by uh, a novelist, Jeff Dyer, who wrote in 2004 wrote a book called Yoga for People Who Can't Be Bothered to Do It. But this, this model of tensegrity wow. suggests that you, mm -hmm. in addition to doing, say, body work or moving m mindfully and, and being uh, attentive to what you're doing with discrimination, it suggests that you would want to have these broad body-wide postures uh, and, and stretches to kind of awaken those connections through the tensegrity um, tissue. Um, exactly. So if I'm in a down dog uh, and my focus is not just, okay, <clears throat> where's my form? How high up am I? Blah, 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 blah. But I'm actually playing and aware of the whole line from my hands up to my back, down the back line, all the way down to my feet. I can play with that idea of this body wide, uh, tension. That's called a pandiculation, a body-wide stretch. It's what your pets do when they get up after a nap. What's the first thing they do? They don't even think about it. They just they do these big body-wide stretches. They don't do an isolated stretch. And that's where I think a lot of this, the anti-stretch movement, a lot of the studies on stretch that say stretch doesn't work is because of the measurements involved have to work in these isolated ways and not these full-body pandiculation kind of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, it's, um, um, I, I lost my train of thought there, Josh. Well, let me, let me, let me feed you one more thing <laughs> because this, this, this understanding of, of tensegrity it, it suggests that, I mean, one takeaway is that increase in tension in any one area will, will propagate a tensional pattern through the, through the, through the system at large. So Correct. you can have attention say coming back to say the the pattern of depression where there's a, a forward slouch that could cause a tension pattern in the front of the shoulder which then could show up with a, sort of a, that's a snarl or a snare in the fascial net which then can show up further or field. A, a, densification. Uh, a densification six to 18 months later six to 18 months later that 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 could create a hardening somewhere in the in the zip code of the pectoralis muscles, which are the chest muscles and the upper arm muscles. Absolutely. So, you know, if you put enough tension on it and it's resilient, it will spring back. If like me, you dislocated one of the bones, <laughs> you've got to work at rebuilding your tensegrity and getting it resilient again so that it can withstand compression and stretch and kind of spring back to where you want to be most of the time. And, 
as we age, we want to maintain that spring. As mu- yes, as much as possible. And in age, age matters not. Um, the uh, you know I've seen people in their seventies who have more spring and bounce than some people I've worked on in their forties. Uh, but it can be, and we do as we age. We things do dry out and such, uh, and tissue does get older, and some things can't be restored, but much of it can. Um, you know, I think of the famous yogi uh, who didn't start till she was in her 60s, hmm. uh, who did all those incredible um, uh, back bends and pretzel twists. That's not Scaravelli, is it? Yeah, Scaravelli. She yeah. didn't start till she was in her 60s. And look what she was able to do by her 80s, you know? And she probably, I don't think she was that flexible when she started. So, you know, there's, there's, uh, in in orthopedics, there, there's a growing branch of orthopedics called um, restorative orthopedics or restorative medicine, or regen, sorry, regenerative, uh, regenerative orthopedics. And it's about how can we leverage the natural regenerative properties of the body to to enhance and restore an injury mm-hmm. or an accident, not just go in there and put in screws and plates and, and give it PT. Important stuff. Um, I'm realizing we're at the top of the hour, and I want to be mindful of your time. Um, but I want to thank you very much for uh, everything you've elucidated upon. It's been a workshop for me, and I hope informative and helpful for others listening. Um, you do structural integration. People can find, look up structural integration and, and look for a therapist that might be able to provide that. Um, mm-hmm. And also your if, book. If you're in the Pittsburgh area, just type in Pittsburgh in fascia. I'll pop right up. Yeah. And then your book, Fascia, what it, is, what it is and why it matters. It's available uh, through Handspring Publishing, and we will be including a link that uh, for a limited time gives a discount, I think, on purchasing it directly through the, the publisher. Direct from a publisher, that's correct. You can get it in numerous outlets, but for you watching, use the link, use the code, get 15% off. A little benefit there. Yeah. All right. Thanks for seeing it, everybody. Thanks, for, thanks so much, David.